middle of my PhD, I reached a point where I was completely and hopelessly stuck. Every avenue of research that I tried led to a dead end. It seems like my basic, basic assumptions just stopped working. I felt like a pilot flying through the mist, and I lost all sense of direction, where it's up, down, left, right. And I stopped shaving. I found it very difficult to get out in the morning. I decided and I felt that I was unworthy of stepping into the gates of the university because I wasn't like Einstein or Newton or, in fact, any other scientist whose results I've learned about because they never, nobody ever told me that scientists get stuck. So I couldn't be a scientist. But luckily, I had enough support to make it through and in the end discover something new, that wonderful feeling of calmness knowing that I'm the only person in the world right now that knows a new fact about nature. And I started the second project in my PhD, and the same thing happened. I got stuck, and then I got through. And I noticed maybe there's a pattern here. I asked the other graduate students, and they said, yeah, that's exactly what happened to us, except nobody told us. We studied science for thousands of hours, but not one hour about the actual doing of science, how to go into the unknown, what happens when you do research. We were taught that science is a you know, series of logical steps, but that's, it's nothing like that when you actually do research. At the same time, I was studying to be an improvisation theater actor. So PhD by day and by night, laughing, jumping, screaming, playing my guitar. Improvisation theater, like science, also goes into the unknown. You try to make a scene on stage without uh, knowing, you know, you, you don't have a script, you don't have a director, you don't know what the other characters or you will portray. But unlike science, in improvisation theater, they tell you from day one what's going to happen when you get on stage. You're going to fail miserably. You're going to get stuck. And you're trained to stay comfortable in that stuck place, to stay creative. For example, there's an exercise where you stand in a circle, and each person has to do the world's worst tap dance. And everybody else cheers and applauds enthusiastically, supporting you on stage. When I became a professor and had students of my own, I had to guide them through their PhD projects. But again, after thousands of hours of researching and studying physics, biology, chemistry, I didn't get one hour of education about the basic concepts of how to guide someone into the unknown, into their own research project, how to mentor, how to deal with motivation. So I tried to make my lab like improvisation theater, to tell the students what it's going to be like when they do research. And this has to do with our mental schema of doing research. You see, whenever a person does anything, we build a prediction, a mental schema of what's going to happen. For example, if I want to touch this chart, before my hand starts moving, my brain already calculates the entire trajectory of my hand, all the muscles, precisely. And if I get blocked, if reality is different from my schema, it causes extra stress called cognitive dissonance. That's why it's very important that your schemas match reality. Now, if you believe what you study in science and you believe the way textbooks are written, you're liable to have the following schema of research. If Let's say A is the question, and B is the answer. Then research is a direct path. The problem is that if experiments don't work, or a student gets depressed, it's perceived as something fundamentally wrong and causes extra stress. So you can teach a different schema. A is the question. B is the answer. And you start going. Experiments don't work. Experiments don't work. Experiments don't work. Experiments don't work. Until you reach a point linked with negative emotions in which it seems like your basic assumptions have failed. And we have a word for this. We call it the cloud. And you can be lost in the cloud for an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, a whole career. But if, <laughs> but if you have enough support, sometimes in the materials at hand, you see a new answer, C. And you decide to go for it. Experiments don't work, experiments don't work. 
you make your new discovery, and then you tell everyone about it by publishing an article, A arrow C, which is a great way to communicate, as long as you remember the process of getting from A to C. Now, the cloud is an inherent part of research. It's part of our craft. Because the cloud stands at the boundary between the known and the unknown. Between the known and the unknown. Because in order to discover something truly new, one of your basic assumptions, at least, has to change. Otherwise, it's not new. And in this light, scientists do something quite heroic. Every day, we try to push ourselves to the boundary between the known and the unknown and face the cloud. Now, notice that I put B inside the land of the known, because we knew about it when we began. C is almost always much more ex fresh, exciting, profound, and also important than B. That's the wonder of doing research. Now, just having a word like the cloud has been transformative in my research group. Students come to me and say, Uri, I'm in the cloud. And I say, great, you must be feeling miserable. <laughs> but I'm kind of happy because it means maybe we're close to the boundary between the known and the unknown. Maybe we stand a chance to make a new discovery. Now, just knowing about the cloud doesn't take away the negative emotions, but at least it detoxifies the feeling that something is wrong with me. Because everybody now knows in the lab that that's the way it's supposed to be. We're in the cloud phase of research, finally. And for me as a mentor, knowing about the cloud helps me step up my support for the student. Because research in psychology shows if you're trying to solve creative puzzles, if you're feeling anxiety and stress, your mind narrows down to safe ways of thinking. If you want to have risky ways of thinking, like what those needed to get out of the cloud, you need to fe have feelings like solidarity and hope. I learned from improvisation theater one particularly fun way to support students in the cloud, to have a playful scientific conversation that opens up new ideas. It's based on the central principle of improvisation theater when we go into the unknown, called saying yes and to other people's offers. Yes and means agreeing and building on the idea. For example, if one actor says, here's a pool of water, and the other one says, no, that's just the stage, the improvisation is over. It's dead, and everybody feels frustrated. That's called blocking, saying no to the other person's idea. If instead, saying yes and sounds like this. Here's a pool of water. Yeah, let's jump in. Look, there's a whale. Let's grab it by its tail. It's taking us to the moon. That way, you unlock hidden creativity by building on each other's ideas. In, in science, you know, there's a lot of blocking and no mindfulness for this kind of way of communicating. In improvisation theater, we say that people have an inner critic that stops us from saying things because, so people won't think that we're stupid or crazy or unoriginal. And saying yes and bypasses that inner critic. And you can suddenly hear voices inside you that you didn't even know existed. In science, when we do this, of course, we keep in mind the science we're trying to do. But sometimes these voices are very precious and give us a clue towards our solution. So knowing about the cloud, knowing about saying yes and, my lab became a very creative and a place where students had high motivation, and we made uh, surprising discoveries on the interface between physics and biology, general principles of how biological systems like our body are designed. And soon enough, I was invited to give conferences in front of large scientific audiences. But this knowledge about the cloud and the way to do research just stayed within my own group. I saw graduate students in other groups go into the cloud without even having a word to describe what they're facing and also their mentors, without having the knowledge that that's when students needed the most support. And so students got stressed, their ways of thinking narrowed down, their research didn't reach its full potential, and they felt miserable. That happens a lot. But it's also true that in science, we just don't spread knowledge like the cloud, because we don't talk in science about the emotional and subjective aspects of doing research. It's just not done in conferences, in meetings. We never talk about it. So I thought, okay, if I just make my group as creative and fun as possible, and if everybody else does the same, science will eventually get better and better. This way of thinking got turned on its head when by chance I went to hear a talk by Evelyn Fox Keller about her experiences as a woman in science, uh, talking about what she learned about the culture of science. And she said, 
Why is it that in science we don't talk about the emotional and subjective aspects of doing research? It's not by chance. It's a matter of values. It has to do with the culture, culture of science. You see, in science, we seek knowledge that's objective and rational. That's the wonderful thing about science. The myth of science, though, which is causing us problems, is that the doing of science, what we do every day to get to that knowledge, is also only objective and rational, like Mr. Spock. <laughs> and when you label something as objective and rational, automatically the other side, the subjective and emotional, becomes labeled as non-science, or anti-science, or even threatening to science. And that's why we don't talk about it. It's under the table. When I heard that, that science has a culture, everything clicked into place for me. If science has a culture, then culture can be changed. And I can be a change agent to try to change the culture of science as far as I could. The very next talk that I was invited to give, I gave my science talk. And then I started talking about the emotional and subjective aspects of science, how it's important for us to discuss it. And I looked at the audience, and they were cold. <laughs> they were confused. They couldn't understand what I'm saying in the context of an objective and rational science conference with 10 back-to-back -back PowerPoint presentations. I tried in different ways to communicate the ideas about the emotional and subjective aspects, and I couldn't find a way through. I was in the cloud. I was lost in the cloud. Until, with my improvisation theater troupe, we did a scene where it happened that I was playing my guitar to, an, to other actors who were portraying scientists. And this was so much fun that I decided to say yes and to this idea. And the next time I gave a, sci a science talk, I asked to give a second talk later about nurturing scientists. And in this talk, I started it off by singing a song about one of the greatest fears we have as scientists that we work hard, discover something new, and then somebody else publishes it before we do. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's called being scooped, and being scooped is terrible. Being scooped makes us afraid to talk to each other because uh, we, we, this, this fear makes, is that that's no fun because we came to science to talk about what we're doing and to share knowledge and to learn. And I do a blues song called Scooped Again. <laughs> And I ask the audience to be my backup singers. I tell them, your part, your text is scoop, scoop. And it sounds like this, scoop, scoop. And here's how it sounds. I, I've, been, I've been scooped again. Scoop, scoop. And then we go for it. I've been scooped again. Scoop, scoop, I've been scooped again. I've been scooped again. Scoop. Scoop, I've been scooped again. Scoop, scoop, oh mama, can't you feel my pain? Heavens help me, I've been scooped again. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for your backup singing. Everybody starts laughing, breathing, noticing that there's other scientists beside them with shared issues and starts talking about the subjective and emotional things that, that happen to us during research. It's, it's as if a big taboo is lifted. We can finally talk about this in a conference. Some of these scientists go on to start peer groups. That's to say they meet regularly, let's say every other Thursday, to talk about the emotional and subjective things that happen to them as they're doing research, as they're mentoring students. Groups like this have formed across the world. There's dozens of groups. And when I meet scientists from these groups, I'm not seeing isolated or defensive scientists. These are leaders, and they feel empowered to make changes in the culture of their institution. For example, starting courses and workshops for, about the emotional and subjective different aspects of uh, doing science. And there's so much to do, because each person can do it differently. We have a lot to learn from each other. It's like a great opening. So you see, this, the culture of science is beginning to change. It's changing one person at a, at a time. As scientists become change agents and do what they can within their own range of, uh, you know, of influence. 
My vision is that just like every scientist knows the word atom, knows that atoms are the basic elements of matter, every scientist will know words like the cloud, saying yes and, and many, many other words, which are the basic elements of how to go into the unknown together. And science will become much more creative, will have many, many more exciting, profound, and very important discoveries for the benefit of everyone. Science will also be much more playful. And what I may ask you to remember from this talk is that next time you face a problem you have no idea how to solve, there is a word for what you're going to see, the cloud. And you can go through the cloud not alone, but with somebody else who's your source of support to say yes and to each other's ideas, to say yes and to your own ideas. So you can increase the chance of reaching that moment of calmness where through the wisps of the cloud, you get a first glimpse of your new, fresh discovery your C. Thank you.